Have you ever wanted to enjoy the Alien film franchise in board game form? Well, don't you worry none, son, because Awakened Realms have got you covered with the wonderful Alien licensed board game. In this delightfully evil box, players can take on the role of crew members on a ship infested with aliens, each of them trying to work together to quell the impending alien threat. Aliens the Board Game packs all the fun of the Alien film franchise into one meaty box. Mm. Oh, I thought, was that bad? I thought that was fine. No, it was all right. It's just I've had a phone call from Disney. They own the, the film rights to Aliens, and I know this is just a silly goof, but they still said, they're going to send Goofy around to break oh, our legs. Jesus. I mean, I thought that Disney don't even own the rights to Alien. Of course it's... they do, Tom. It's a film. Well, hang on. It's not the Alien game. It's... Nemesis. Yeah, but... Tom, we've got to get this picture of the alien from Aliens off the box. No, no, that's the alien from Nemesis. Yes, that's right. It's what the alien looks like in this totally non-copyright infringing game. In Nemesis, one to five humans are on a probably doomed ship, and you're all collectively trying to avoid aliens and get home alive. You'll wake up from cryo sleep and then stumble around the ship, uncovering new rooms, searching them for items, and fixing all the broken parts of the ship so you don't all die a horrible death. The problem is, each time you move around this tin can, like a sardine trying to get back into bed without waking up any of its tin mates, you're going to make a lot of noise. Whenever a player moves their piece from one room to another, they'll roll this horrible little dice, placing a noise token in the connecting corridor matching the number that you just rolled. If one corridor ever contains two noise tokens at once, well, your clattering around has piqued the interest of a slimy friend that's going to come and eat your arms and legs and heads until almost all of your arms and legs and heads are gone. When you've made too much noise, you will reach into this bag and pull a token from it, which will determine which kind of alien will be dispensed into your lap like an unwanted scoop from the ice cream van of chaos. And boy, are there some unpleasant flavours to try. Everything from the diminutive larvae to the monstrous towering queen. She'll eat your face up in her nest. Well, actually, sure. All of these gunky folks have different ways of chowing down on your fragile human body. So before they get a chance to slurp on your meaty crewlets, It's a family show! You're gonna have to defend yourself. Searching the various rooms on the ship is gonna yield all kinds of items that will better help you stop that alien threat from eating all of you alive. Your end game, though, is to escape this galactic pickle. And getting into an escape pod? Well, that's easy. They unlock automatically and immediately as soon as you activate the ship's self-destruct sequence. Or if somebody on the crew dies. Both fine, entirely normal criteria. Or don't get into an escape pod, just go back into cryo sleep, which you can do straight away. As soon as this many rounds have passed, that's about half the game. So just stay alive for about half the game. And then just go back to sleep. No problem. Also, you'll have to make sure that the ship is actually heading to Earth, and if it isn't, change it, its course. That's two separate, quite time-rich actions which both take place here on the ship's bridge. Oh, and you'll also have to check that the engines are working, or at least two out of three of them, and they're all the way on the other side of the ship over here. So if you can get here and do that, and then get here and do that, then go to cryosleep, you'll be fine. Otherwise, you still might be fine, it just might be that you go to sleep and then you all go to Jupiter and die, or the ship explodes and you you die. But don't worry, you've got a unique set of action cards, and for now, a functional weapon. Each of the game's unique characters has a tight little deck of just ten cards. Some of these cards represent specific unique skills to your character, whereas other ones just see you leaning towards certain aptitudes. Everyone aboard the ship can fix things, Kevin. It's just that some of us are bad at it. 
You've got a lot of ground to cover here, but if you play to your strengths and work as a team, well, we should just be able to stabilize this ship, get back into cryo sleep without anything truly terrible happening. But here's the rub. Well, not actually a rub, but more of a tiny, anxious, burning dread that runs across the board. You're not necessarily working together. All of your individual crew members are gonna have their own personal objectives, which they're gonna to need to fulfill. And those range from the quite inane, such as make sure we all get home safe, to the evil and nefarious, like make sure player one doesn't survive. These secret objectives completely recontextualize everything within the game. Now each individual mechanic is a double-edged sword. A locked door that previously kept an alien out can now seal you in, and a player moving off into the dark is no longer going forward to scout, but maybe leaving you behind? Most importantly, the fact that you can't attack another player directly means that the aliens are a threat, sure, but they're also a lethal, unpredictable tool to leverage. This game has an abundance of rules, but almost everything makes sense both mechanically and thematically. And even when it is a bit overcomplicated, it's fiddly in a charmingly intoxicating manner. The way that the captain reloads their revolver one bullet at a time. The fact that closed doors don't actually stop aliens, they just stop them once, and then that door is gone. The fact that every weapon in this game has a special ability, and the special ability of the scientist's pistol is that when you roll a critical hit, you don't do any additional damage. And we haven't even talked about the infection deck and the infection mechanic. An entire deck of cards that you draw from the top of every time you get hit by an alien. These cards go into your already tiny deck and immediately start gumming up the works get three or four, and on some rounds, you'll start to feel like you're just a big bumbling bag of alien gunk. But it's worse than that, and even more exciting, because these infection cards might not actually be infected, and the only way you can find out is by going to a location on the board or getting an item that lets you use this lovely red acetate scanner, putting your cards in and finding out for real if you're doomed. Scanning these cards is the only way that you can remove them from your deck, but if it turns out that any of them are infected, you'll have to add a larvae figure to your player board. If you ever have two, oh, two of these on your player board at any, oh, well, I think I know where this is going. As Tom was just saying, at any point, if you have two larvae on your boards, you immediately explode and an alien bursts out of you. Maybe out of your chest or another, you know, less legally distinct area. Anyway, I'd best scuttle off to frighten a cat or something. Good luck with the rest of the review, human. Thanks, friendly alien. Oh, I'll sort you out later when I pack away the game. To be honest, with some of these components, there's probably a baggie big enough for, for him in here, eh? But jokes and horrifying deaths aside, there is something marvellous about the exact manner of how this mechanic with these larvae works. You see, if you have one larvae on your board, not a problem. Two, big problem. But the only way you can get a second larvae is when you yourself check your own infection cards. And maybe you just don't do that. You could always just take a pun on never scanning these individual cards, and then find out when you actually get into an escape pod at the end of the game, whether or not you're taking home a fun bonus passenger. If finales get any spicier than this, then I'm not sure I have the heat tolerance required for them. And these rules being deliciously horrid helps a ton when teaching people how to play the game, especially if the people you're playing with are willing to take the first game as introductory. That way you can just jump in and explain rules to people 
as they become relevant, presenting them to people as if you're a proud parent. Well done, sport. I see you've just discovered the instantaneous alien death mechanic. If people just accept that the first game might be a little frustrating or wonky, you can just dive in and season the meal as you go, even if the seasoning that you're adding every time will always be salt. Matt, Matt, did you just make a Salt Bay joke in 2020? Is that bad? Is he dead? Or cancelled? Or owned by Disney? Also, aren't you dead? No, I'm an android. Like a, well, like a robot. Yeah, I put it in my cover letter. Did you not read it? Oh, no, I don't read cover. Can you help me get rid of this? I uh, don't see why not. So what have we actually told you so far? This is an ambitious, big box, plasticky thing that on paper sounds really, really cool and exciting, but I could have told you all of that in just two words, this Kickstarter game. And so you can't really have science fiction horror without at least a little evisceration. So with that in mind, let's get to business. These alien minis are fun and fearsome, but would have been equally atmospheric and scary if they'd been half the size. The scale of these doesn't make it a better game and arguably for me does make it a less appealing product. And then you've got all of this love lathered onto these fantastic 3D miniatures and yet some of the other design and art is just feeling a little bit like it could have done with more love. This board, for example, thematically wonderfully dark and grimy, but in reality could have done with just a little more pop to make it clear what and where everything is, especially if you're working in a room with downward lighting as all houses do. We've actually got a filter on the camera right now, Tom, could you twist it around so people can see what it would actually look like and not just the, the little filter at the end. No, not that one, it's fine, no, sorry. No, not this one? No. No, not this one? It's all right, I Wait, thought I just- Hold on, Matt, this one. No. Oh. Tom, the one at the front. Yeah. If, if this gives you a vague idea, like, you know, it's just, as soon as you get a bit of light reflecting off this board, it's just completely indiscernible. Does that, does that make sense, Tom? Yeah. Cool. And meanwhile, we've got so many interlocking systems and mechanics, many of which are interesting and fun, but a lot of which honestly just seem like they want to grab you by your cheap lapels and scream, look, we've, look at all the things we've put in from that film you like. We've got alien eggs you can destroy or carry away as souvenirs. Yay. A flamethrower. <sighs> An item that lets you take two guns together. Ooh. A whole series of mechanics to do with getting covered in slime, then having to have a shower, and then in the shower discovering that your body is host to an alien and you are now very likely to horribly die. Hey. Not to nuke anyone's picnic, but I'd say that about one in six people I've played this game with have actively hated it and never wanted to play it again. And that's a wicked little die to roll. With the exception of exciting late game drama, getting killed just completely sucks in a way which is fairly unavoidable. And even when you're still alive, it's very likely that you'll spend long stretches of the game feeling completely powerless. Uh, we should move into here this turn, I think. Yeah. Got to get. Oh, no, there's, there's still an item in here, so I could get the item in here. And, yeah. I'll yeah, but we've, we've got to move. We've got to keep moving. We've got to move on this turn, sure, surely. No, no, I'm going to get the item in here. I'm going to get the item. Uh, we can move in there next turn, but this turn, I'm going to get the item. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Cool. 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 News flash time. Mum, this game isn't fair. At any point, some characters will simply be more useful than others. You want to go left, but I want to go right, but you've got ammo in your gun and I don't, so we're going left. But violence isn't the only language that matters here. And during any game of Nemesis, any player could find themselves suddenly holding all of the cards in a negotiation. You might find yourself untouched and powerful, the one that everyone else follows around as they hope to momentarily get your attention like toddlers following an older child. But equally, you might find yourself limping behind, trying to guilt trip or straight up bribe other players to take an interest in the charity of keeping you alive. And I'm sorry, 
But this isn't one of those games where suddenly on the next turn your fortune's reversed and then everyone needs your help and you get to be the hero. No, if your character starts having a bad time, the story of that game is likely to be one in which your character just has a really bad time. And when you realize that it probably toast, it's just not all that fun. Of course, you've got the optional rule that lets you play as the alien in the event that you do die, but to me, it makes it so difficult to win as the crew that I never really want to play with it. It just feels kind of tacked on. I don't know if I agree with it being tacked on, but I definitely do feel like the rule allows you to be the alien you want to see in the world feels like a dangerous tool without proper instructions. Mm. My personal reading is that the function of this rule is to provide a healthy exhaust for early knockout bitterness and then to accelerate the game so you can maybe just start another one. It's a system that just doesn't account for the fact that you might not want everyone else to die. Sure, you get wiped out early and you come back and you exact your revenge on the specific player that you blame for your personal demise, but you're not re-entering the game as a laser-focused angel of vengeance. You, you basically make the game much harder for everyone, which means you should not. It's not a job appropriate unless you are going back into the game as the alien with the intention of wanting literally everyone to die. Maybe really this just feels poorly implemented because the rest of the game is so far from being black and white. Even the nature of being a traitor in this game isn't as simple as cut and dry evil. At the start of the game, you get given two objective cards. A personal one, a broadly more human-friendly mission, and a corporate objective. Maybe HR just wants a loose end cleaning up. But maybe I'm just more interested in research than you. Maybe I'm really quite keen on popping to the alien's uh, hive nest, whilst you would rather avoid it. Does that mean we can't get along? The key thing is that you choose which of your two objectives you'll pursue only after you first encounter an alien. Up until that point, you can keep both of your objectives in mind, but as soon as you see an alien, well, you have to just fix all of your hopes on one. It's a bit like Fog of Love, except in Fog of Love, you're accepting the sad reality of a divorce, and in Nemesis, you're accepting the sad reality of locking Stephen in a room so he'll get eaten by an alien. So it's, it's similar. But it's the fact that you make that choice then that's important. Because in other similar games with traitor mechanics, that question is asked out of the blue. Do you want to pointlessly stab your friend in the back? And that's something that can be fun, absolutely, but it's not what leads to treachery. So maybe I chose the objective that means I only succeed if you don't make it home. And who can blame me? I mean, when I had to pick my objective, you were trapped in a room with an absolute unit and I was on the other side of the ship. And to be honest, this objective looked quite fiddly. So of course I had to pick the one where you'd die. And I mean, I didn't, I didn't want you to die. It was just, it was just convenient. And obviously, when you escape from that encounter completely unscathed and absolutely fine, well, I had to think on my feet. I just had to improvise. Crucially in Nemesis, the choices you make aren't only defined by your secret objective card. To truly explain how this all works, I'm going to tell you the story of what happened the last game we played. So we're playing a three-player game of Nemesis. I'm the scientist, Tom is the scout, and friend of the show Drew is the engineer. And Drew's like, I'm gonna go off and fix the engines. Fine, good idea. I guess we'll go up towards the bridge? Anyway, we split up because Tom wants to go and try and find some items, fair enough. But meanwhile, things aren't quite so hunky-dory for me. Anyway, just about make it out alive, get myself patched up, and I think I'm going to be okay as long as I can just catch up with Tom in the, in the control. Tom, if you could just wait, wait. Drew, Tom won't wait for me, and I'm, I'm not in a good way. Can you, Drew, could you come and help? I'm just checking the engines, so I can't. Drew, you're not checking the engines, you're just rummaging around in cupboards. Uh, you know, I can't help. Ah, flip. 
So I eventually managed to catch up with Tom's character, eventing some genuinely very large aliens, and then he just immediately leaves. And then the alien follows me into the room. And I'm like, Tom, is there anything you can do to help right now? I can really do with it. Okay, so I'll play a card that lets me do all of my actions in one turn. Great, fantastic. Just quick. All right, so first of all, I'm closing the door. I'm locking the door. Sorry, what? And now I've, I've left. I've gone somewhere else. Tom, hang on. And now I'm in the, the escape pod room. I've, I've left again. Oh, my. You absolute. You wanted to kill me the whole time. After being so evasive, it made perfect sense. No wonder he kept running away and didn't want to help me. For the whole game, Tom's objective was to see me dead. And now I was, I was dead. With a crew member now dead, the escape pods unlocked and Tom prepared to get inside of one until- Do you mind waiting for me? I'll come with you in that escape pod. Ah, uh, Drew, I would, but uh, look, I made all this noise and I kind of want to get leave now because of the noise. Yeah, but there's two slots on that escape pod and I could, I could sit in one with you. I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting in the pod now, Drew, bye. It's all right, I've got this card that lets me go anywhere on the ship using the vent. Drew, you make so much extra noise. Sorry, Drew, I've got to go, bye. And it was at that point that Drew realised that Tom's objective wasn't to make sure that Matt died, but to make sure that he never made it off the ship alive. And, you know, after that, loads of aliens turned up and just sort of ate his face and legs and he died. So listen, this game is not a clean piece of design. About 15% of your friends might actively hate it. And that story we just told you. After all of that stuff panned out, Drew was quite understandably a little bit sour, at least until the next day as the passive time, as it so often does, fermented that mild trauma into a delightfully palatable, delicious story. But hopefully now you're starting to see what this game is. This box is an engine for creating stories, but in beautiful keeping with the series it aims to emulate, most of these stories feature rather sticky endings. And how much fun you're likely to have with it is completely dependent on how willing you are to die in the service of creating a great story. Personally, I love doing that. Whenever I play role-playing games, I always create characters that are uh, have an incredible death wish just because as soon as you stop caring about whether or not you live or die, everything just becomes much more fun. But even though everyone knows that these stories are full of death and murder and misery and backstabbing, in reality, sitting there for 45 minutes whilst everyone else plays and you're dead just isn't much fun. 85.7% of the people aboard the Nostromo in Alien died. That is the cost of telling that story. And as soon as you realise that that is the objective of this game, well, all of the mess of this game, and it's still messy, takes on a new kind of clarity. I'm just gonna come out here now and drop the mic from orbit. I love this game. I love it. It has got seven out of 10 video game written all the way through it. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is this is a game that is rough and strange. And if you smoothed off all of those harsh edges, you would make a game which was more consistently fun and more consistently palatable. But in doing so, you would completely erase all of the ability to have the searingly hot highs and terribly low lows that make this game wonderful. There's some salt on this board still, there's still some salt. And so now, in the same way that you might re-watch a film that has an integral twist, I feel like we need to go back and look at the slightly messy design of Nemesis. Not through the lens of it being a fun game, but it being a simulation, a sandbox designed to amplify a very specific kind of experience. And I think a lot of the really clever stuff behind the curtains of this game come down to the way they've used a mechanic that I honestly thought I was maybe kind of done with. The hidden potential traitor mechanic, something that's been thrown into a lot of games. With the sort of reckless abandon that you might add paprika to goulash. And much like Paprika, it's something that often looks really exciting, but personally, I don't think it's actually very interesting. Because the traitor mechanic in Nemesis isn't an afterthought. This isn't just, oh, there's a baddie in the game, gotta deal with it. This central conceit sharpens Nemesis's focus to a fine point, a point that sits just below the ribs. 
Nemesis has so many little tricks up its sleeve to make those traitorous systems engaging, like the way that you choose a character only after seeing your objectives, letting you take the person that's right for the job, but always in a way that's gently wary of what other people have already picked. The Scientist, for example, is the number one character to pick if you want to activate the self-destruct sequence. Or what about the Captain? It's not unusual for games like this to have a leader character that can move other players around the board with their consent, but the orders being barked here aren't open to debate, which could be an issue if they aren't on your side. But maybe you're just being paranoid. You see, the thing I think that makes this game different is that too often games with potential hidden baddies in rely a bit too heavily on theme. Now, I really like Dead of Winter, but it's a game that relies on you accepting that people might be acting strangely simply because the zombie apocalypse tends to broadly have that effect. Meanwhile, other games rely too much on pure social deduction. They're the baddie, I can tell, because of they're doing that weird thing with their face and their eyebrows. It's there. Nemesis has me realizing that the weakness of many games where you might have a baddie is that everyone else has a very clear, unified, singular task. And anyone who is deviating from the critical path that you've all decided is the correct thing to do now is immediately worthy of distrust. And it means that you haven't really got much room to operate as a baddie without immediately being faced by a sea of raised eyebrows. And at that point, your ability to play is wholly linked to your ability to directly deceive. And that's where a nemesis all of the obfuscation of these systems really comes into play. So here's the thing. This isn't a case of a team of Care Bears being infiltrated by a bad, bad bear. At best, you're just a dysfunctional family, arguably kind of on the same side, but a bit of selfishness is constantly expected. It's all very well to say, let's all stick together, but as a counterpoint, I personally don't want to die. And... <laughs> Now the worst slice of this deliciously bad pie is that even if you do find out that somebody definitely wants you dead, there's nothing you can do about it. It's not like they flip over their board to the bad side and cackle in a brilliantly theatrical way. No, the game just carries on. They want you to die and they'll just get on with the game. Right. Social deduction has limited value if there's nothing you can meaningfully do in response. In Nemesis, there's no point in fixating on whether or not somebody wishes you might die, because just like in real life, there's nothing you can really do about it, uh, which is in itself quite stressful. And yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, maybe Susan is actively trying to kill you, but she's not actively trying to kill me, so I'm not sure why I should care. Nemesis's messy web of mechanics and things all serve a beautiful purpose when combined with the chaos all around you. So many things to do means so many reasons you might be zigging when everyone else is insisting that you zag. When I reviewed the endless adventure Megabeast Gloomhaven, I found tremendous soul in the spaces that allowed the players to be disruptively selfish. If people have to work together, that's not cooperation, that's coercion. And this cuts both ways. If you don't get a choice to betray someone, then you never really betrayed them. You were always just a secret antagonist, which is cool, but it's not the same thing. Even the most ruthless moves in a game of Nemesis will come from a player who chose that path for whatever reason. But that also gives true collaboration so much more meaningful power. <sighs> Nemesis is a game in which it's really hard to cooperate with people. You know that you need to, you know that you should, but then the game pokes you slowly along a horrible tightrope in which every form of collaboration is constantly weighed and measured and eyed with a healthy spoonful of distrust. But here's the crushing thing about it. Maybe someone doesn't actually want you to die, but does it functionally make any difference if they simply don't care? 
I can't think of a single action that doesn't appear completely selfish under the wrong lighting. And this only works because the game is this mess of crazy mechanisms and boondoggles and cogs and systems that leaves everything nicely fuzzy and intentions unclear. It's the second game that you play with the same group that's the bite point. Because once you've become acquainted with the game's systems, everything becomes a lot crunchier and meaner and more strategic. And distrust spills across the table. That being said, after that second fantastic game, it's not perhaps a reliable evergreen choice to cozy up to on a Sunday night, but more of an experience game that flamboyantly spreads itself across a table on special occasions. Let's stay in tonight, light some candles, murder Stephen. And personally, my favorite part of the game is just showing it to people, taking these mechanics out of the box and laying them on the table in a way that's almost theatrical. And there's nothing quite as satisfying as whopping down the alien queen. It's a sensation that only Cthulhu Wars can really rival. Speaking of Cthulhu Wars, this game has a similar pricing problem, namely that it's really expensive in a way that it can only kind of justify with its miniatures. Yes, this is the part of the review where we're gonna talk about these bulky boys. These are cool, but for me, it's way too expensive to buy on my own and will be something that I would consider for a group purchase. But then, does Nemesis really have the staying power to entice my friends multiple times? I'm not sure if it's better than something like Twilight Imperium, which hovers around the same price point. I love this game and I'd love to have this game, but for what it is, it's very big and very expensive. This is a game that I would absolutely love to see in a really trimmed down, squeezed down box. Imagine something like the Brass Birmingham box. Oh, that beautiful, wonderful game. Don't get me wrong, some of these plastic gubbins can absolutely definitely stay. These little yellow translucent noise tokens, lovely stuff, lovely stuff. But listen, I can't help but imagine a version of this game with cardboard standees? Is that, does that make me a heathen? I don't know. Listen, I can and I will recommend Nemesis. I just wish it was easier for me to justify, not just to you, but to myself as well. This strange incendiary little game should be a little game. It doesn't quite fit in this large, over-the-top polished wrapper. It's a game that I think is cool enough that it, it should be on everyone's shelf, but as it stands, something this big, I'm not sure for how many years I'll be able to convince myself to keep it on mine. I would never suggest a version of this game that was mechanically less ostentatious, but physically, I just feel like something trimmed back would actually be a better fit for the game that they've actually made. If you've got enough money and space for a game like this, then fill your boots. But for a lot of people, maybe it's a good idea to get a few stories out of it and then find it a new home. Yeah, I'm keeping it mainly because I've got about three or four friends who will watch this video review and say, oh man, that game looks great. Can I come around your house and play it? And I'll be like, yeah, sure. Let me check my diary. I think I'm free in 2023. But on the up, something I will say about Nemesis is Unlike Lords of Hellas, a game that was built on a foundation that required exponential plastic, there is scope here for doing some really cool expansion stuff that doesn't add tons of new minis. I mean, is that likely to happen? Almost definitely not, no. They're probably just gonna make loads more aliens, but you know, if you've given up on hope, you've given up on life. And that's um, our review of Nemesis. Can't really recommend it. Literally won't stop recommending it. Love it. It's a mess. Hopefully that's all entirely clear. And uh, now, yeah, this is the point where usually we would just do a bit where we, uh, Tom, can we get like something to come in and uh, like do the end of the review? Maybe a, a callback from a comedy character where we could, it will come back and say like and subscribe, but it's not us. It's like one of those sort of goofy kind of things. Like, I don't think we can do on that front, Tom. Big Ben Barry, I'm just recording this message in advance before I go on my nice skydiving holiday.
Shut up and sit down, put loads of good work into the videos, and you should give them a like and a subscribe for lovely Matt and then the other ones. It's great, you'll love it, and they'll love it too. You can also watch the video next to my shiny big metal head. That's all for me today, and I'm sure I'll see you again soon. Bye!